Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Retina Roundup. I am Dr. Mayur Chaudhary, fellow in Vitro Retina and Ocular Oncology. I am here with this month's top 6 articles. Let's begin with the first article which assessed visual acuity in dry AMD patients in prospective randomized sham control clinical trial using transpalpable external microcurrent electrical stimulation with Macumira device. In this study, the treatment group received 4 treatments in first 2 weeks and further treatments at weeks 14 and 26. Difference in the best corrected visual acuity and contrast sensitivity were estimated. The change in number of letters read from baseline in treatment group compared to the sham control group was 7.7 at 4 weeks and 10.4 at 30 weeks. Similarly, benefits were obtained in contrast sensitivity as well. Thus, this pilot study demonstrated improved visual measurement and is very encouraging as a potential treatment for dry AMD. Moving on to the second study, which evaluated the outcome of switching from proactive, that is, treat and extend, to reactive, that is, chlorinata treatment after developing advanced central neovascular age related macular degeneration. Data were collected from a retrospective analysis of a prospectively designed multinational registry of a real world neovascular AMD treatment outcomes. No eyes that continued proactive treatment developed more than 15 letters loss, but 8% of all eyes that switched to a reactive regime and 15% of active submacular fibrosis eyes did. The study concluded that eyes that switched from proactive to reactive treatment after developing macular atrophy and inactive submacular fibrosis can have stable visual outcomes. Physicians should be aware of the risk of a significant loss of vision in eyes with active submacular fibrosis that switch to reactive treatment. Next study describes the shovel and cut technique using bevel vitrectomy probes to address diabetic tractional retinal detachments. The bevel tip of the cutter is used in a shovel manner to create tissue plane between the diabetic plaque and the retina. As the bevel tip of the cutter moves parallel to the underlying retina, Scar tissue naturally feeds into the cutting port where it is cut and aspirated with low flow rates. This technique thus allow us to remove the most difficult plaques in diabetic membrane in a safer, more controlled manner than previous described techniques. Coming to the next study which describes OCT biomarkers as a predictor of visual improvement in diabetic macular edema eyes receiving dexamethasone implant. In this retrospective observational study, the medical record of naive and non naive eyes with diabetic macular edema who received at least one dexamethasone implant per review. It was concluded that a thicker baseline CST may serve as a positive predictor of early visual improvement and sensory neural detachment presence at baseline may be a negative prognostic factor for CST increase four months after the dexamethasone implant injection. Other well known biomarkers such as disorganization of the inner retinal layers and hyperreflective foci did not demonstrate prognostic value on visual outcome, at least within the first four months following the injection. The fifth article deals with the factors affecting myopia in retinopathy of prematurity after laser treatment. A total of 33 eyes of 17 infants with ROP who underwent laser treatment were included in the analysis. In addition, an age-matched control group without ROP was prepared and ocular structural parameters were compared. Although there was no statistical difference in axial length between two groups, spherical equivalent was significantly more myopic in the ROP group. In laser treated ROP eyes, axial length, corneal refraction and crystalline lens power were related to degree of myopia. Moreover, the number of the shots applied also affected the myopia status in laser treated ROP eyes. However, only crystalline lens power was correlated with the laser shots applied. Moving on to the last article which studied recurrent flutters after limited vitrectomy for vision degrading myodysopsia. A total of 286 eyes undergoing limited vitrectomy for vision degrading myodysopsia were studied retrospectively. Sutureless 25 gauge vitrectomy was performed without intentional surgical posterior vitreous detachment induction. Patients were evaluated using ultrasonography and contrast sensitivity testing to characterize this subgroup and identify the clinical profile of patients at risk of recurrent floaters. It was concluded that recurrent floaters after limited vitrectomy for vision degrading myodysopsia are caused by new onset PVD with younger age, male sex, myopia and fakic status as risk factors. 
inducing surgical pvd at primary operation should be considered in this selected patients to mitigate recurrent floaters that's it for now see you next month with another interesting five new articles thank you